So Rachel, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, I believe you have the oath in front of you. I'd be very yes. obliged to read through it. Thank you. Okay, I, Rachel Vaughan, solemnly affirm by all that is sacred and righteous that my testimony is given freely and without coercion and is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. We're very obliged for you to, for giving that testimony. Obviously, everything that you say is um, of great importance and it's very important that you yourself believe that what you're saying is going to be of, of relevance to those who are going to be listening, but also that it is the truth as you Absolutely. understand and have experienced it. Um, and I want you to feel free to say whatever you need to say here. This is, this is not a court about you. It is an inquiry. And it's one in which we wish to, from time to time, ask questions. So forgive us if, if we stop you every now and then we ask things that we think need clarity or some clarification. But in your own words, if you just begin your testimony, they'll be very kind. Thank you. All right, so I was born in 1973 um, and I grew up in a suburb of Adelaide in South Australia called Edwardstown. I'm speaking to you today about an organised group of pedophiles in South Australia who abused me physically, sexually, emotionally, and through satanic ritual abuse spiritually throughout my childhood. What I suffered at their hands was terrible, but what I was forced to witness being done to other children was far worse. During my childhood, I witnessed the murders of six children. My father, Alan Maxwell McIntyre, was directly involved in all six of those murders. He also forced me to watch him dismember a further two children. I know where two of those children are buried. My half-brother, Andrew McIntyre, who was born in 1952, backs up my allegations against our father as he too was sexually, emotionally and physically abused by him. Andrew was also forced to perform multiple body, body disposals at our father's behest, incinerating them, then burying them, those remains at our former home in Edwardstown, South Australia. It is Andrew's intention to discuss these matters with your tribunal at a future date. We have another sibling, my half sibling and Andrew's full sibling, Ruth Collins, who also corroborates our allegations of sexual and emotional abuse against our father in countless documents and statutory declarations, which she has written to your authorities over the past 12 years. In fact, Ruth is named in three books by individual authors, naming her as the only credible witness to have made allegations about what happened to the Beaumont children. The case of the three missing Beaumont children is a globally known instance of multiple child abductions from the same family. On Australia Day 1966, nine-year-old Jane, seven-year-old Anna and four-year-old Grant Beaumont disappeared from the beach at Glenelg, an outer suburb of Adelaide. Since that date, local Adelaide newspapers and media outlets have kept up a running commentary about that terrible event and how the disappearance of the three innocent children changed the way Australian parents looked after their kids forever. It is considered one of Australia's most baffling cold cases. Andrew corroborates Ruth's account of what happened at our home on Australia Day 1966 and what occurred in the weeks both before and afterward. Both Ruth and Andrew have alleged that both our father and Anthony Munro were involved in the abduction and disappearance of Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont. Whilst that is Ruth and Andrew's story to tell, I bring it to your attention as my father has been widely named as a person of interest in the disappearance of the Beaumont children since 2007. Google his name and countless articles appear naming Alan Maxwell McIntyre as a person of interest in that case. My father was never charged, never prosecuted by South Australian police, not for the sexual abuse of his three children and not for the murders that he committed. Alan Maxwell McIntyre died a free man on the 13th of June, 2017. He lived out his life openly bragging about the fact that none of his children could ever have him charged with incest as he had immunity from prosecution because of his knowledge concerning important people. Two more witnesses have come forward and made allegations in 2018 to South Australian police. Those allegations being that our father's close associate and twice convicted pedophile, Anthony Munro, was involved in the abduction and disappearance of the Beaumont children. In fact, my father named Anthony Munro on camera as being responsible for the Beaumont children's disappearance in a filmed interview with journalist Brian Litley in 2015. 
Adding to validating the five or four mentioned witness allegations that Anthony Munro, also known as Tony Munro, was involved in the Beaumont abductions is a salvage and expedition diary co-written by my brother, Andrew, in 1966. This diary chronicles the activities of our father, Anthony Munro, and several members of a men and boys salvage and expedition club, which put them all on Glenelg Beach in the days and weeks leading up to the Beaumont disappearance. Although Ruth, Andrew and myself were unable to have our father incarcerated for our abuse, my brother Andrew had, has had success in incarcerating one of his perpetrators for child sex abuse. In 2016, Andrew and another man had Anthony Munro convicted and sentenced to 10 years jail for the brutal sex abuse they endured in the 1960s. Allegedly, the offences occurred at the same time as the Beaumont children's disappearance. I allege that the Salvage and Expedition Club, of which Anthony Munro and my father were members, was in fact an adjunct to another of my father's <coughs> sordid group, which also predated upon children. The second group I refer to has been dubbed by local media as the family. It is my allegation that my father was this particular group's body boy. Allegedly, the family have enjoyed well-documented protection from legal prosecution for decades. The family abuses have been felt by hundreds of victims in Adelaide and beyond since the 1950s. Many of those victims, including myself, have been vocal about that abuse. In fact, there was an inquiry in 2007 into the treatment of South Australian children in state care, known as the Mulligan Inquiry Commission of Report, and also titled, Children in State Care Commission of Inquiry, Allegations of Sexual Abuse and Death from Criminal Conduct, as a result of the countless statements of former awards alleging abuse at the hands of this organised, sadistic group of pedophiles. These abuse state wards have been dubbed the Takeaway Kids. One of those state wards, Kai Meakin, has written a book about his own ordeal at the hands of these predators, and his book is actually named Red Tape Rape. The Mulligan Inquiry, chaired by Edward Picton or Ted Mulligan QC, documented testimonials from hundreds of former children in state care alleging abuse against 922 perpetrators. The Mulligan Inquiry into the Institutional Responses to Allegations of Sexual Abuse and Death from crim Criminal Conduct also led to Australian Cardinal Pell and Archbishop Wilson facing court for charges relating to their knowledge of the abuse occurring but failing their duty of care to report the crimes and protect victims. Archbishop Wilson was recently found guilty and sentenced to six months home detention for his failure to assist the child victims. This inappropriate sentence has caused an outcry of injustice from the victims of the abuse, including from the greater Australian and worldwide community, where Archbishop Wilson refused to acknowledge the crimes and prevent further abuse from occurring. During the Mulligan inquiry, it was also alleged that many South Australian children in state care disappeared. Death certificates stating the cause of death as natural causes were issued in 100 cases of state ward deaths in South Australia. The declaration of natural causes as a reason for child death is not protocol. Eight cases of child death within the South Australian institutions involved criminal negligence. Astoundingly, of the 922 perpetrators named in the Mulligan inquiry, South Australian police investigated only 13 culprits and of the 13 perpetrators scrutinised, only two were ever charged and prosecuted. At the end of the Mulligan inquiry, our then Attorney General, Michael Atkinson, sealed the inquiry records, suppressing the names of those perpetrators for 80 years, leaving all of the victims who gave testimony to the inquiry good reason to feel betrayed by their government. And I was also one who, who gave evidence to the inquiry that I was not a state ward, and I was asked personally by Ted Mulligan to provide that information. Andrew will no doubt tell you himself why he believes that some of those state wards declared missing by their siblings and friends during the Mulligan inquiry provided the human remains which he was forced by our father to incinerate on our Edwardstown property during his childhood. What I now wish to refer to is another betrayal of government which is linked to the mass abuses of children in South Australia's history. 
In the 1950s and 1960s, approximately 150,000 of the United Kingdom's boards of state were sent out to Australia and other countries, including New Zealand. These children have been named by United Kingdom authorities as the stolen children. These children have been widely reported as being abused in their adoptive countries. Most were utilised in labour camps. With the full knowledge and backing of their adoptive governments, many were also sexually abused. Countless died due to poor conditions, malnutrition and the nature of the enforced labour for which they were procured. Of the 4,000 children sent to Australia in the 1950s and 1960s from the UK, only 2,000 remain. The question is, where did the other 2,000 go? Andrew believes he knows where to find their remains. South Australia has a very sordid history when it comes to the treatment of children. We have the family murders, a group of young men and boys murdered and mutilated in the 1980s and early 1990s who rema whose remains were left to be discovered. Then there is South Australia's missing children. Countless children abducted and reported missing in South Australia over several decades, never to be seen again. Some of those children include Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont, already mentioned, Joanne Ratcliffe and Kirsty Gordon, Louise Bell, Michael Black and Rihanna Barrow. In fact, Adelaide, South Australia has the unfortunate distinction of being described globally as the murder capital of the world. We also have the Maralinga experiment, where nuclear devices were set off on the outskirts of Adelaide between 1956 and 1963 in weather conditions which allowed the radioactive dust to fall over the greater population of Adelaide. After the nuclear tests, cows were pastured on radioactive grass. The resulting milk, known to contain significant levels of strontium-90, was then given free to public school children. Later, strontium-90 levels were measured by testing the right femurs of exposed Adelaide resi residents, which were collected illegally. Reports that the right legs of cadavers were being harvested by grave diggers and medical professionals and sent off to the motherland can be found in Frank Walker's 2016 book, Maralinga. In this narrative, Walker describes this government experimentation, which has been implemented upon the Adelaide population, the effects of which are still being felt today. I would now like to give a voice to the eight victims whom I witnessed my father dispose of and who are unable to speak for themselves today. In 1976, at the age of three, I was witness to the sounds of the murder and sighted the disposal of a little boy of around four years old on a boat skippered by my father and his best mate. This best mate I will, I will call WB. WB was also a member of the Salvage and Expedition Club mentioned earlier, which had as its members persons of interest in the Beaumont case. In 1977 or early 78, at age four, I saw the dismembered remains of a child in my father's bathroom, along with the severed right foot of an adult male. My father was standing over the bloodied remains with a small hatchet in his hands. A private investigator has suggested to me that this girl may have been missing child Eloise Warledge, who disappeared in 1976. In 1981, when I was approximately eight years old, I was forced to participate in the mutilation of a little blonde boy who looked to me to be around six years old. This occurred in a tunnel system which I believe may be the Sleeps Hill Tunnels on the outskirts of Adelaide. The Sleeps Hill Tunnels are currently owned by a close relative of Anthony Munro who was also a member of the Salvage and Expedition Club and a person of interest in my children's disappearance. At around that same time, I was forced to witness dismemberment of a young man in the back of my father's boat, whilst it was parked in the carport of, sorry, carport of my former childhood home at Edwardstown. This was during the period of time that the aforementioned family murders were occurring. This victim was approximately mid-teens to early 20s, with dyed black hair, which was blonde at the roots, a slim build and wearing a distinctive lanyard. Also in the early 1980s, I was taken to an Adelaide Hills location where, including myself, about nine other children, as well as approximately 50 adults were witness to the murder of a baby boy of around 10 months old. This murder was conducted by a man whom I have identified as looking remarkably similar to a former Attorney General of South Australia. The baby was handed to this man by a young woman with bright red hair and blue eyes, 
who was wearing a hooded floor-length green cape. This was the most horrific of the child murders which I was forced to witness as a child. And I won't describe the death of this baby as it's too horrific. However, I will say that the death involved fire and prepared this poor little thing, poor little child's body for consumption by the audience. My father offered some of that poor baby's cooked flesh to me that day, but I refused to eat it. He insisted repeatedly that I try the meat as it, as it was important for the rest of the group to see that I had participated in the ritual, but I refused. In 1983, I witnessed the abuse of abducted 14-year-old boy Richard Kelvin in the cellar of my family home in Edwardstown. Sometime later, I was taken by my father to visit Richard in another tunnel system of what seemed to be a water treatment facility. At the time that my father took me to this facility, Richard appeared to be near death. Shortly afterward, I heard the news reports that his body had been found near a dam in Coosbrook on the outskirts of Adelaide. The way in which Richard Kelvin's body was discovered by a member of the public and whose report responded to by South Australian police is typical of the police response to serious crimes reported in South Australia. A man had found Richard Kelvin's body and called police to alert them to that fact. Typically, the officer this man spoke to did not believe him. It has been reported that it took some convincing for authorities to finally turn up to take Richard's body away. There is a known culture within the South Australian Police Force where people reporting crimes of serious offences, especially sexual assault, are treated as delusional. Even more disturbing, the organisation which takes the reports called Crime Stoppers is not even government owned. All reports of historical crimes must be made through Crime Stoppers before a police response can be elicited. The people manning these phone lines typically treat reporters of serious crimes as nuisance callers. In 1983, I was also witness to my father perpetrating the abuse and murder of abducted 10-year-old girl, Louise Bell. Louise Bell was abducted in January 1983. At some time, around June of that year, I found Louise gagged in the cellar underneath our family home in Edwardstown. For approximately three months, Louise was kept a captive of my father in our cellar. During that time, in around June of 1983, Louise, family murder victim Richard Kelvin and myself were abused and filmed together by my father, suffering and being forced to participate in sexual acts. Not many people had filming equipment in Australia in the 1980s. However, my father had access to state-of-the-art video and filming equipment as a result of his associations with Adelaide's Channel 9 studios. There have been many connections between my family and the family of murdered teen Richard Kelvin. My sister, Claire, Claire McIntyre, now deceased, owned a house in Tranmere with Richard's aunt, Carol. My second cousin, Penny Ann, was a producer at Channel 9 Studios in Adelaide, where Richard's father, Rob Kelvin, was a newsreader. The Kelvins purchased Penny Ann's North Adelaide home. The Kelvins were at McIntyre family barbecues, and I met Richard several times prior to the awful events which led to his death. It has been reported to me that Richard was working for my father's sister, Barbara Adams, at one of her childcare centres prior to his abduction. During the time that Louise Bell was held captive under our Edwardstown home, she and myself were both abused by then Chief Inspector of Police, Graham Bennett Fraser. Between 1981 and 1983, former Chief Inspector of Police, Graham Bennett Fraser was also abusing two other young girls, one also nine years old. In 1986, when those two girls first made allegations against Fraser, his punishment was simply demotion from his rank as Chief Inspector of Police to simply inspector of police. This was due to a 1984 statute of limitations preventing pedophilic crimes perpetrated prior to 1984 being prosecuted in South Australia. That ridiculous statute was overturned some 10 years ago, thanks to a group of dedicated volunteers, including my sister Ruth Collins. Overturning the statute of limitations contributed to Fraser and others finally being charged with criminal child sexual abuses which were perpetrated prior to 1984. As a result of the statutes of limitations removal in 2009, Fraser was convicted and jailed for the abuses of those two girls and he was up for parole in 2017. 
I put it to you all here that the very existence of that 1984 statute of limitations proves that terrible things happen to children in South Australia. In 2012, I first made allegations to South Australian police that former Chief Inspector Graham Bennett Fraser sexually abused Louise Bell and myself in 1983 when I was nine and Louise was reportedly 10 years old. I made these allegations against Graham Bennett Fraser at the same time that I alleged that my father had killed Louise Bell in front of me in September 1983, after which my father buried her in our Edwardstown backyard. These allegations were reported in a statutory declaration which I handed to my local police officer in Bulwer on the 19th of January 2012. In April of 2012, after hearing nothing from South, South Australian police about my January statement, I again contacted my local police station looking after the progress of my report. It was at this time that I was told that the local Gulwa officer who had taken my statement could not find anyone at the major crime department who would take it from him. I then proceeded to send a copy of this statutory declaration to the major crime department directly. Again, after hearing nothing for several weeks, I contacted the Major Crime Department to query the progress of my allegations. This was not the first time I'd been fobbed off by South Australian police. I have been making allegations against my father of sexual abuse and multiple child murders since 2006 and have been roundly ignored. Report numbers have been refused to be given. The Sex Crimes Investigation Bureau refused to return my phone calls regarding my father's assaults and all complaints that I had made to departments such as the Police Complaints Authority, Police Ministers and other statutory bodies responsible for disciplining police were met with the same continued responses such as, your allegations do not warrant further investigation and your case has been deemed an operational matter. And that's a very important statement, operational matter. As there was a, an operation in South Australia um, within the police force at that time called Operation Deny and I, I believe that the name of that, that operation was specifically designed um, and a specific directive to South Australian police officers to deny any allegations that were gave, given to them. And during that time in, in the United Kingdom, there was a sister operation going on called Operation Red Flag. In May 2012, I finally, finally managed to engage with a Crime Stoppers agent who agreed to continue my call through to a detective at the Major Crime Department. After speaking with this detective, it was decided that an interview was finally required. I was then contacted by a second major crime detective who suggested that I meet him for an interview in the car park of the Christie's Beach Police Station. When I asked why I couldn't be interviewed in the station, I was yelled at by this detective. He then ranted to me that he didn't know anyone at the Christie's Beach Police Station, as if this was reason enough to conduct an official police interview in a car park. I found the prospect of meeting this irrational detective terrifying and engaged a lawyer. My lawyer advised me not to meet this detective in a car park of any description, after which he organised a meeting at the Major Crime Offices in Adelaide for me. During this June 2012 interview at the Major Crime Offices, in the presence of my mother, I told the two attending detectives several facts about the Louise Bell case which had never previously been relayed by the media. Firstly, I told them that her first name was Tracy. This revelation made the detective in charge of the Louise Bell case nearly fall off his seat. I then told the detectives that after her murder, Louise Bell had been buried in my father's former Edwardstown backyard over which was poured a small slab of concrete. At the end of the interview, both detectives assured me that they would investigate the property in question. Both detectives soon after contacted me on a Saturday night at 9 p.m. The conversation which followed beggared belief. Both the detectives insisted that the girl whom I saw murdered and buried at Edwardstown was not Louise Bell. I insisted that she was. The conversation went on for some minutes with both detectives adamant that the girl in question was not missing girl Louise Bell. However, I stood my ground as I was certain of her identity. Finally, both detectives seemed to concede defeat in trying to convince me otherwise and the call was terminated. And there was video footage of Louise Bell aired shortly after the two um, interviews that I had with the Major Crime Department. And in that, in, in that footage, it was shown that she had exactly the haircut that was different to the photo that was always aired of her in the media. And her hair was sun bleached, it's exactly as I had described to Major Crime Detectives in my first interview. So I was absolutely, absolutely certain it was her. 
In the days following the conversation with the detectives, I was called back for a further interview at the Major Crime Department, conducted by the same two detectives. At this appointment, I had both my lawyer, Craig Roberts, and my mother present. At this second interview, I was told by the detective who was not personally responsible for the Louise Bell case that I must be mentally unwell. This was despite my psychiatric evaluation to the contrary, which I had sought and cost me quite a bit of money in 2007 just simply to lend credence to my allegations, but it was useless. The same detective told me that my allegations regarding a cellar and tunnels which exist underneath my father's former Edwardstown home, Edwardstown home couldn't possibly exist. The detective stated that he had visited the home in question and looked into termite inspection points assuming that these tunnels were a figment of my imagination. Inspecting these termite inspection points was unfortunately the full extent of this detective's investigation. He did not look into the roof space to find the trap door, which I had already told him, led to a ladder behind a pantry in the laundry. This ladder led to the underground cellar. The detective also failed to check the end bedroom for evidence of the disruption of floorboards, which had been pulled up prior to the current owners moving in. As I'd already told this detective, the reason the floorboards were pulled up was because the original boards had been cut to allow a small hatch into the cellar below. During my time in the home, this hatch was covered over with a piece of free floating carpet over which my father's bed was always stationed. This detective also failed to discover that these tunnels do exist under the Edwardstown area. I have a private investigator who has furnished me with a plethora of documentation of those tunnels, including photographs of the many tunnel openings in the area, houses with access to the tunnels, and industrial complexes in Edwardstown which document the, those tunnels in detail. Finally, this detective also failed to take ground penetrating ra radar equipment to the place where I allege Elise Louise Bell is buried and scan for her remains. It has been brought to my attention by a child protection advocate that the tunnels underneath the Edwardstown area are still being used today by a group of organised pedophiles who use those edifices to traffic children from one house to another. I allege that some of the houses in question which sit over this tunnel system with access are owned by members of this organised group of predators. How do I know this? Because the child protection advocate with whom I am in contact is the support person of a child who is currently being abused in those tunnels and whose abusive parent owns a home with access to the same underground system. And this is my main reason for coming to you today. I've been making these reports for 12 years, but when I discovered some months ago that this child was still being abused in the same area, I was just so incensed as a mother um, and so disgusted at the South Australian Police that I decided to put my life on the line and speak to you all here today. Not only do I have extensive evidence that the tunnels under my father's former Edwardstown home exist, my allegation that my father's former home sat over a junction of two of these tunnels has also been substantiated. This made my father's former home very well placed for child trafficking purposes. These tunnels led in one direction down Macklin Street towards the Tock H Scout Hall, whilst the other end of this tunnel ran under a nearby main road named Cross Road and continued towards the Glenelg tram line. One end of the east-west tunnel ran under a home on the corner of Cross Road and Almond Grove, which my father described as possessing a killing room. I was taken to this house on Cross Road as a small child and practiced, and practiced on by men who conducted procedures such as catheterizing my urethra. I suffer urethral stenosis to this day as a result of those procedures and have been forced to undergo surgical interventions in adulthood to retain the ability to urinate without a catheter. It is important to note here that my father knew many people in the medical fraternities at both Adelaide and Flinders universities and medical centres in Adelaide. My mother even gives an account that my father used to dissect our female cats. Others have also made similar allegations that my father performed medical procedures on our family pets. However, he had no formal medical training. He was formerly an electrician and wiretapper for Australian Telco Telecom. The house on Cross Road had a butcher at the front and a bakery at the side, all on the same property. Behind a cabinet in the kitchen was a hidden room which was fully lined with stainless steel, 
including tracks at the bottom of three walls and plumbing. The steel lining of this room's walls rose approximately five feet up each side. I was taken to this house by my father on another occasion when I was also a small child. On that occasion, I was forced to watch as my father instructed and presided over the conduct of two other males, who then butchered the corpses of two men. The two unknown men who conducted this procedure, I had not met prior to this event and never met again to my knowledge. Both men looked very similar, but of different ages, as though they were father and son. When the bodies were cut up, they were packaged into two separate suitcases. And there have been other cases in South Australia where bodies of dead people have been found in suitcases. I've heard allegations that in 1973, one of our family members, who was then aged six, pointed this crossroad house out to another family member as they drove past one day. This six-year-old stated that our father had forced him to clean up a lot of blood at that location. This was at the time that two young girls, Joanne Ratcliffe and Kirsty Gordon, went missing from nearby Adelaide Oval. This is another of Adelaide's disturbing and all too frequent unsolved missing children's cases. The dual kidnappings of these two girls from the Adelaide Oval in August 1973 has been dubbed the Oval Abductions. This is a cold case which has never been solved according to the media and South Australia Police. However, private detectives and journalists, as well as one victim's family member, have collated ample evidence suggesting a person of interest from the Utina area, which is north of Adelaide. Despite this, major crime detectives also refused to view or consider that evidence. My father has been named as a person of interest in the Oval Abductions case also. In his defence, as an alibi for this crime, my father has stated that he was away as a Navy reservist during the time that the Oval Abductions occurred. However, despite extensive searches by myself and professional researchers, there are no Navy records to support his alibi. Getting back to the tunnel system under Edwardstown, it is my allegation that there are multiple homes of interest along the tunnel system. For example, a family with the surname of Giesing once owned one original home dwelling that was built in the Edwardstown area. In 1985, a man called Raymond Giesing was convicted, then exonerated of the abduction and murder of Louise Bell. It is possible that it was Raymond Giesing's own family home, which stood just up the road from us in Edwardstown, and this may be why he was a person of interest in her case. Of course, I don't know because the South Australian police won't share any of their information with me. In the opposite direction along the same tunnel line is a home on Pine Avenue that was owned by a former superintendent of South Australian Police, J.A. Vogelsang. Superintendent Vogelsang established the police search headquarters at the time of the Beaumont abductions in 1966. The tunnel which intersected under my father's family, sorry, my father's former home with the first tunnel mentioned above, ran in the opposite direction at 90 degrees and went under the nearby railway line on Railway Terrace in Edwardstown and also under Main South Road beyond. It is along this railway line that tunnel entrances can be found and of which I have several photographs supporting their evidence and their existence. And I remember coming out of one of those entrances as a child. Um, this tunnel at 90 degrees to the original tunnel described here also runs under homes which have access to this tunnel via basements and other openings. And I have proof of those as well. In reference to the allegation that my father was responsible for the disposal, sorry, for the disposal of multiple children's victims' bodies, I need to refer again to the aforementioned house with the killing room on the corner of Crossroad and Armoured Road. As mentioned earlier, this house had on the same property a butcher and a bakery. My father told me many things about this house as I was growing up. He said that the special activities in the killing room spilled out into the butcher and bakery attached. I did not understand this at first, but I do now. My father was a cannibal. He was quite proud of the fact and often bragged to me that if he ate the flesh of 100 victims, he would become immortal. This was part of an aspect, or was an aspect of his satanic faith, and my father was involved with the Rosicrucians, uh, the sect of the Golden Dawn, um, which was started by Alastair Crowley, that my father adored. Um, and my family has a very long history with Freemasonry. My grandfather, Joseph Wright, was supposed to have been the head of the Freemasons in his time. <sighs> OK. 
Okay. He alleged, my father alleged to me as a child that the bakery and butcher on the property with the killing room on Cross Road was there for butchering, sorry, for butchering and selling people human flesh and that was only sold to special customers who knew, who knew how to introduce themselves correctly. In, pri in fact, a private detective has shown me a particular type of sticker that can be found on certain Adelaide butchers, which has a King K on it. And by King K, it's a K with a crown above it. And is reportedly a signal to Freemasons, Rosicrucians and members of other satanic cults in Adelaide that human flesh is sold there. The butcher on Cross Road outside this house still reportedly sports this sticker and I've been sent a photograph to show that. This would suggest that clandestine activities in the Edwardstown area are still in operation. The saddest and most infuriating part of my allegation about these tunnels is the fact that had my testimony been properly investigated in 2012, the little child who was currently being abused in Edwardstown may never have been abused in that location. Further to the interviews conducted at the Major Crime Department in 2012, I wasn't just told that I must be mentally unwell and the tunnels in Edwardstown couldn't possibly exist. I was also told by the detective who was the official officer on the Bell case that every child born in Australia receives a birth certificate. This was an astoundingly naive assertion by a major crime detective and my lawyer interjected on my behalf at this point in the interview. The detective made this ridiculous assertion in response to further allegations I had made about the aforementioned baby boy whom I saw ritually abused and murdered in the early 1980s. Not long after the humiliation of this second major crime interview, announcements were aired in the media that a section of the former backyard of a man named Dieter Fennick was to be excavated in the hope of exhuming the remains of Louise Bell. When I heard this, I became frustrated that my allegations were still being ignored by the major crime department despite my interview. Despite the ill treatment I had received, I still wanted to do whatever possible to tell Louise Bell's story on her behalf. And I was witness to a lot of her suffering, so I feel very responsible for that girl. So I made another attempt to contact the Major Crime Department. I was again put through to the detective responsible for investigating Louise Bell's case. I asked, I asked him why he was searching Dieter Fennick's former backyard instead of investigating my claims that Louise Bell was buried at Edwardstown. I was told by him that my allegation lacked credibility because I apparently made the statement that Louise Bell was interred under a small slab of concrete after recent news reports that Dieter Fennick's former property was being reinvestigated with particular attention being focused on the small slabs of concrete on Fennick's former property. It was at this point that I came to the conclusion that the detective responsible for investigating the Louise Bell case was fabricating a reason to ignore my allegations. I came to the conclusion because in fact the detective had actually heard my testimony that Louise Bell was interred under a small slab of concrete days before this media story was ever released. In fact, the first time that I alleged Louise Bell's remains were buried under a small slab of concrete was to my brother Andrew in a phone conversation on the 5th of September 2009, and my brother is happy to attest to that fact. The first official allegation that I, that I made that Louise Bell is buried under a small slab of concrete was in a statutory declaration to the South Australian Police on the 29th of September 2009. On the 1st of August 2016, I took my allegations about Louise Bell's murder to the Independent Commission Against Corruption. I was soon informed by an officer of that commission that I could not make allegations to them because my statement involved the misconduct of a police officer. I was then referred to the Police Ombudsman's Office. I then took my allegations to the Police Ombudsman's Office and was again told that my statement was not to be investigated. I rang the police ombudsman's office and asked why my allegations were being ignored. I was then put through to the officer responsible for recommending allegations to the police ombudsman, a man who, will I, who I will name here as WM. WM was formerly an officer employed by the police complaints authority and with whom I had already had interactions. In fact, WM told me in 2012 as an officer of the PCA, that none of my allegations were ever to be investigated by that authority and that he was the only officer I would ever be able to speak to in that department. He also told me during this 2012 phone conversation that I had been 
dealt with already. And he repeated this admonition three times during our 2012 discussion. I might add that it was said most menacingly. There is more to my efforts to have the Louise Bell case adequately investigated, but trying to explain it all here is difficult. In 2016, Dieter Fennig was convicted of the abduction and murder of Louise Bell, despite my allegations. This was based on DNA evidence found on Louise's pyjama top, which was, she was wearing on the night of her abduction, and which was later placed on her neighbour's lawn by an unknown person to be submitted as evidence. In other words, this was left out to be found. It could easily have been contaminated. Despite my contact with the Department of Police Prosecutions in 2016, my allegations were never discussed during Dieter Fennig's trial. However, during the trial, a letter did suspend the trial for some time, but again, I do not know if that was anything to do with my allegations. I have suggested that the Major Crime Department compare the two other DNA samples found on Louise Bell's pyjama top and never identified against my father's DNA, which South Australian police do have on file. I wish now to discuss the final murder, which I was forced to witness as a child. This murder was perpetrated in 1987 by my father in the bathroom of our Edwardstown home. The victim was a blonde, blue-eyed boy of approximately 12 years of age. My father and his third wife completely remodelled this bathroom following this boy's murder. Although the tiles were all removed and replaced, it is likely that some of this boy's remains are still embedded in the brickwork of the bathroom wall, wall which stood behind him when my father shot him in the head with his rifle. So that concludes the murders and mutilations I was forced to witness as a child. And what follows is an overview of my attempts to have my allegations properly investigated by South Australian authorities and authorities in Australia in general. I have contacted over 70 individuals and 20 different departments in attempts to have my statements of abuse and child murder adequately looked into. These include the Crime Stoppers organisation already mentioned, the Adelaide Sex Crimes Investigation Bureau, the Adelaide Major Crime Department, the Mulligan Inquiry, the Victims Rights Commissioner, the Police Complaints Bureau, which I need to mention was disbanded in 2009 amid allegations of corruption and inaction the Queensland Pedophile Task Force, the Independent Commission into Corruption, various police ombudsmen, and again, I need to mention that in 2016, the police ombudsman's office was also um, made defunct due to allegations of inaction and corruption. The Office of Public Integrity, and I love the name of that office because again, they're completely useless and did nothing to help me. The Internal Investigations Section of South Australian Police, the Department of Police Prosecution, the Legal Services Commission, the Australian Federal Police, two former Prime Ministers, four Senators and 23 individual South Australian parliamentarians. Four of those parliamentarians made the effort to personally meet with me to discuss my allegations and referred my matter for further investigation to the appropriate authorities. South Australian police similarly ignored three of the parliamentarians who made efforts on my behalf to force an investigation into my claims. It wasn't until 2016 when Member of Parliament Rebecca Sharkey responded to my request for assistance that the Special Crimes Unit finally took action against my father for one of the sexual crimes he perpetrated against me. This was a full 10 years from the time I first made official allegations to South Australian police about this particular assault. The assault in question is important to describe here as it indicates my father's involvement in cult activity. In 1975, at the age of 30 months, I was just out of nappies at the time, my father sadistically and ritually cut into the mucosa of my rectal wall with a curved blade knife, after which he raped me anally. He also subjected my sister Ruth to the same ordeal when she was four years old. A child protection advocate who is well versed in the activities of Luciferian and auto temporary orientist cults, having recently heard my testimony about this assault, has indicated to me that this knife is reminiscent of a bowline knife or Celtic sickle utilised by such cults. On the 25th of July 20, 2008, I received a medical report from Professor of Colorectal Surgery Nicholas Riger. Professor Riger had medically examined me at his North Adelaide rooms some weeks beforehand. 
Professor Riger's medical report states that the internal injuries, which I described to him, which culminated in a permanent cutaneous nerve defect, are consistent with my allegations that my father inflicted this injury upon me. In fact, Professor Riger explained to me that the only way to create this sort of internal cutaneous nerve defect is to introduce a sharp object to the area and cut through the nerve and mucosa. Professor Riger in the same report offered to appear in a court of law and make this declaration on my behalf. It took me a further seven years and the intervention of parliamentarian Rebecca Sharkey for I was able to find a South Australian police officer to take Professor Riger's report a substantiation of my claims of anal assault against my father. I have given detail about this particular assault here as it is significant in comparison to similar injuries sustained by family murder victims in the 1980s and 90s. Unfortunately, during preliminary investigations by the Special Crimes Unit of South Australian Police regarding this assault, my father died. On the 13th of June, 2017, in death as in life, my father escaped any possibility of being charged for his crimes. In exasperation after my father's death, I collated a statutory declaration of all of the assaults which were perpetrated against me by my father and other cult members during my childhood. This I submitted to the Special Crimes Unit on the 29th of November, 2017. On the 2nd of February, 2018, I received a letter from the Special Crimes Unit stating that the crimes outlined in my statutory declaration, which I submitted the previous November, would not be further investigated. Soon after this response from the SCU, I read in the newspaper that the new head of that department is a former major crime department detective who heard my sister Ruth's allegations and those of my mother back in 2009, but did not act upon them. I now wish to read out to you the 2018 response of the Special Crimes Unit to my numerous allegations of serious crimes against multiple perpetrators outlined in that statutory declaration as it is a perfect example of the ineffectual responses myself and siblings have received from government departments in this state of the past 12 years. And I'm quoting here from the SCU, from a detective senior sergeant, Ms Vaughan. I am in receipt of your correspondence dated 29th November 2017, where you wrote allegations against a number of persons for historic sex crimes against yourself and the murders of several children. A detective has reviewed your information. As a result of the review, I have determined that no further investigation will be conducted. The information that you have provided will remain on file. I have wondered many times over the years why my father had immunity from prosecution for pedophilia and murder throughout his lifetime. Researchers who have heard my testimony suggested that I look for information relating to MK Ultra mind control techniques. After extensive research, I came to the conclusion that there are corresponding factors which I and other family members have experienced, which leads me to think that my father and his pedophile cult were involved with MK Ultra mind control experimentation. My brother Andrew and I have come to believe that our father was a member of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation known as ASIO. The best evidence to support this belief is the fact that our father worked for 40 years as a wiretapper the telecommunications company Telecom, which is now known as Telstra. Our father was also in the Navy Reserves and travelled extensively throughout the world on Navy expeditions. He also procured child pornography for the black market. I know this as I was often the subject of filming. I was filmed both at home as well as at the Channel 9 studios in Adelaide. On one occasion in 1977, when I was three years old, I was taken to the Channel 9 Adelaide studios and met family murder victim Richard Kelvin for the first time. I was sexually assaulted on that date by a former Adelaide radio DJ who died not long ago. Another victim of child sexual abuse who was associated with Adelaide Channel 9 studios is Janet Kreese. Janet had a well-known Channel 9 newsreader as a brother, as her brother, sorry. Janet's book, A Reason to Live, released in 2005, chronicles her allegations of sexual abuse perpetrated by her pedophile father. Like me, Janet's father not only abused her sexually, he also allowed fellow pedophiles to abuse her. 
With regard to declarations by South Australian police employees that there is not one shred of credible evidence supporting allegations that my father perpetrated serious crimes, I have this to say. There is, I allege, solid physical evidence of my father's multiple child murder victims at two of his former properties in Stansbury and Edwardstown. Unfortunately, until those remains are exhumed, that evidence will remain elusive. There is significant, significant anecdotal evidence from my corroborating half-brother and sister that re the remains of the three Beaumont, ch Beaumont children lie in a silk sinkhole at my father's former property at Stansbury on the York Peninsula. In fact, Ruth and Andrew's witness accounts giving credence to this belief is convincing enough for third parties involved with a Facebook page called In Memory of the Beaumont Children Missing Since 1966 to publish a petition to force South Australian police to exhume the remains of Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont from the Stansbury sinkhole. And at last check, over 48, or sorry, 4,800 people have signed the petition. The petition was fuelled by administrators of that site, including journalist Brian Litley, who interviewed my father extensively about allegations brought against him by Ruth and Andrew in the years before his death. It is from one of these interviews that I will now quote my father's own declaration about what happened to the Beaumont children in 1966, and I quote, I know a lot about the Beaumont killings. I want the whole bloody mess looked at. Now I'll get around to who killed the Beaumonts, you want to know about Tony Munro? He is deeply involved. He is one of the most evil pieces of work that ever drew breath. Munro turned up with the three bodies in the back of the car. And that's, and I end quote that, and that is my father. Here my father substantiates my sister Ruth's claims that the Beaumont children were shown to her in the boot of our father's car on Australia Day 1966, a claim that she's been making since 2006, sorry, since 2007. The car was parked outside our Everstown property at this time. In the same interview, my father went further to claim that Anthony Munro, and I quote, arrived at my house on the 26th of January with the three children in the boot of my car. I didn't even own the car and it never happened when I was there. I believe Munro is up to his eyeballs in this, end quote. In a signed letter, which my father wrote to a major crime detective in 2012, which predates this interview, my father also states the following. Tony Munro is a person of interest to Detective Brian Swan. At the time my father wrote this in 2012, Detective Brian Swan was the presiding officer over the Beaumont children's disappearance. What follows now is a statement my father made in a filmed interview, again with journalist Brian Litley, in which he acknowledges finding his good mate and convicted pedophile, Anthony Munro, in bed with his young son, Andrew. And I quote, I caught him in bed with my son. They were bundled and naked. I didn't make a scene. He was a boy, a beautiful boy. He was my son and he was in love with a scoutmaster. End quote. And Tony Munro was Andrew's scoutmaster. At the time that my father states that he found the adult Anthony Munro with my brother, Andrew was only 13 years old. Munro had been abusing him for years. I allege here that only a pedophile could find a grown adult male naked in bed with his juvenile son and not make a fuss. For my father to then, to then try to blame the interaction on Andrew by stating that Andrew was in love with his scoutmaster is offensive in the extreme, an outright lie, according to Andrew, and is again an indictment of my father's status as a pedophile. Earlier this year, the back property of a factory in North Plimpton, just a short walk from Edwardstown, was exhumed in the hope of finding the remains of the Beaumont children. The exhumation of this land was based entirely upon the witness account of just one man. Amid a furor of media reports, the dig at this North Plimpton site yielded nothing but animal bones. Despite this failure, the major crime department in Adelaide have continued to refuse to exhume the sinkhole at Stansbury. Despite my witness testimony of the murder and burial of Louise Bell, as well as another child who was murdered and buried there in 1987, my father's former property at Edwardstown has not been excavated. It has been put to me over the past 12 years amidst assumptions, amidst assumptions of false memory syndrome and mass hysteria by members of my family who do not wish to believe that my father, Alan Maxwell McIntyre, was a murderer and terrorist 
that I and my corroborating siblings have made up these allegations against our father for attention or financial gain. There has been no financial gain in my fight to bring these crimes to light, but there has been enormous cost. The negative attention which my attempts to tell the truth of my childhood has elicited the most cruel, vindictive and painful reactions from my once loved family members who chose to take my father's side over my own and those of Andrew and Ruth as well. In fact, it's been a rocky path for me since I began making allegations in 2006. I wish that I could pretend that these things did not happen as so many of my family members have managed to do. Unfortunately, the survivor guilt with which I suffer on a daily basis will not allow me to put my head in the sand and pretend that these events did not occur. Not even to save those family members who have denigrated myself, Ruth and Andrew for the past 12 years, the embarrassment of having to explain their actions and protecting my father from the prosecution and scrutiny he deserved. And I say that because one of my family members contacted me early, early last year and stated that if I didn't stop my crusade, that many members of my family would have to suicide. It is justice enough that my family will in future have to accept that their mis misguided efforts have robbed our father's victims of any opportunity for true justice. In speaking about these crimes and the perpetrators who abused me, I have put myself in serious danger. Bad things happen to whistleblowers in South Australia. My sister Claire's death in 2009 is a prime example of what happens when people refuse to keep quiet about terrible crimes in South Australia. Claire was also present on Australia Day 1966 when our father and Anthony Munro brought the three deceased Beaumont children to our family home in Edwardstown. As my brother Andrew has stated in media reports in June last year, Claire was forced to brush the blood and sand from the children's hair as they lay in the boot of our father's car. In August 2009, Claire made a call to the Major Crime Department and made an appointment to speak with the detective about her witness account of what happened to the Beaumont children in 1966. The next day, Claire was found dead with a broken neck in her own backyard. Confoundingly, and despite submissions from myself, Ruth and Andrew that Claire was most likely murdered because of what she knew, the current South Australian coroner refused an inquest. He ruled Claire's death a suicide and released his findings to her senior next of kin. It is possible that this senior next of kin was our father, the person whom myself and siblings alleged to the coroner had likely ordered or even executed Claire's death. It is important to note here that in the months prior to her death, Claire had been reporting to family members that someone was trying to kill her. Her declarations became so distressing for family members that she was placed in a mental health facility. It was only shortly after Claire was evicted from this mental health facility against her will that she was found dead. It is not lost on me that my allegations put me in a great deal of danger. Claire's untimely death is testament to that fact, but it's a danger that I've been forced to face on a daily basis since first making allegations in 2006, and it's a fear I've had to live with my entire life. In fact, my father tried to take my life on many occasions. I made the choice to tell the truth regardless of the dangers in 2005 when memories of my disturbing childhood pervaded my dreams, turning them into repetitious nightmares. I am now in a position where I've made too many allegations to be able to slip into silence and still hope for longevity. Therefore, I have become before this tribunal today in the hope that my revelations might at last shed enough light on my father's crimes to force authorities to finally investigate. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you very much, Rachel. You are so brave. Um, I think many victims and even dead victims uh, must be incredibly grateful for what you are doing now. Um, be proud of yourself. Thank you. I have some questions, but I first uh, leave the word to uh, Chris Gary. I'll be back to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, you're very clear. Um, the testimony that's been given quite clearly as well sheds a light upon something in an area that um, has been concealed clearly for a very long time. 
Um, there also clearly seems to be a lot of attempts to be made in the past to actually shed light on this from various, various areas. Hmm. Um, do you feel at all, especially in the case of um, Dieter Fennec, um, but others as well, that where uh, the authorities have uh, said that they will investigate, they have actually investigated in the wrong place or in the wrong way in order to actually prevent a proper investigation? Yes, I do. Um, also, the other question that I wanted to ask is that in regard to um, Dr. Riker's report, would he be willing to give evidence to the tribunal? I, I could certainly ask him. It's been some years since I've, I've met with him, but I do have that report on file. Yeah, I mean, the, the report is on file, so perhaps we could look at both those solutions. Sure. Um, and without putting um, any other family members at risk, um, did Claire ever give testimony on uh, oath as well at any point? Not that I'm aware of, okay. unfortunately, no. Well, we'll, we'll, perhaps we'll discuss the other matters offline. Um, Commissioner Kerry Housewood, could you want to now take the floor? Yes, I do, if possible. Um, if it is too difficult for you, you just tell me, Rachel, okay? Then you just say, I, I, it's too hard for me to answer this question. But I think it's important for people who are still doubting that these things happen, um, that they know some answers to some questions. Uh, I've been dealing with this for 35 years, and I have victims all over the world who don't know each other, who are not from the same gender, who don't speak the same language, who do not come from the same religion, you know, and, but all the, the statements are the same. That's why it's so important to make a database. Um, my first question is, how come you look so well? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I don't believe I do. <laughs> where, where do you get this strength? I asked it to other victims too, because that's what people see. They see a strong, beautiful woman. And they say, well, can't be that bad. It is. And the same happens because I've always been working, especially with child sex offenders and child murderers. Uh, I'm sure they will use your well-being as an excuse to justify that it's not so bad to abuse children and to, um, to uh, expose them to such violence. Because look at Rachel. She's okay, isn't she? Can you explain that? I've suffered depression for most of my life and I have a, a chronic anxiety disorder which has prevented me from working for most of my, well, for many years. I, I do have work at the moment but the work that I do does not require me to leave my home very often. I am, I'm a telephone consultant. I'm very lucky so that I don't have to face too many people. My, my friends and family can attest that I'm not okay. <laughs> um, been quite messed up by the whole experience. It doesn't mean it's true. No. You know, you, you are okay. You're very strong, by the way. But um, what would you say to those criminals, those, and please don't call them pedophiles, pedophiles anymore, call them pedocriminals or pedosexuals. That's a much better word. Um, what would you tell them now? What would you be your message to them if they use your well-being appearance um, as an excuse that it's not that bad? What would you tell them? That they didn't break me. That they may have tried, but I'm not a broken person. I became stronger from the experiences that I went through. But not in the way that I could then become affluent or successful but in a way that made me so determined to prove that these things did occur and to put those people where they belong, in jail. They did not occur. They did that to you. You know, a, a lightning, a thunderstorm, something that occurs. But what they did was what they did to you. It, not a, it didn't occur. It is something they decided to do. So it was a free choice. Yes. Let's let's put the right words where they belong, okay? You are not to blame, they are the ones to blame. So that's my first um, a question. 
the second is, yeah. Again, we see a testimony, as I've seen tens of them all over the world, of the involvement of the states, the governments, the police departments, the, especially childcare, schools, yes. justice departments, uh, churches, medi the medical world. Um, mm -hmm. Well, just think of uh, in the UK, uh, Saville, uh, the a boys town in the United States, uh, the Dutroux case in Belgium. And each time they have to, to investigate something, they don't do it. They just don't do it. Mm. And you must be lucky that they don't throw you in a mental uh, health hospital. So, well, it has been threatened. It was threatened to me by my father because his third mm -hmm. wife was a psychologist. So I, I had those threats. And in fact, my father's first wife died in a mental institution shortly after my sister told her what happened to the Beaumont children. And what, her, they did, what they did to the Beaumont children. Yes, yes. So, um, so Margaret McIntyre died in Glenside, a mental health facility in Adelaide, at the age of 33. And the then coroner, Colin Manick, deemed her, her death from natural causes. Mm -hmm. She was a very healthy woman, 33-year-old woman. Mm. So it doesn't mean that all these people that uh, write false reports are involved in the crimes themselves, but we are speaking of thousands or thousands of uncountable uh, cowards. Yes. They know, but they don't speak like you do. <coughs> I would like those cowards to finally get out of the dark and start talking. And there are many, be it in childcare, be it a coroner, be it a doctor, be it a uh, judge, talk. But what religion had your father? He was a member of the Golden Dawn sect and a Rosicrucian, uh, and I believe he was also a Freemason. But that's not a religion, is it? Well, depends on where you come from. <laughs> mm. What was your father's profession? In fact, was uh, an electrician. He was an electrician, but he wiretapped so he listened into the phone calls of people on a daily basis that was his job um so what did your mother do as a profession well she was mostly a mother but she also worked for a chiropractor as a um uh, secretary for mm -hmm. some years and on on a financial basis how did your family do middle class uh, my older siblings say that they were often very hungry but I didn't experience that sort of hardship. We seemed to have food on the table, bills were paid. Were, they, were, they, were your parents and the family living above their stand for what they earned? I would say they just scraped by. That is strange because most of those that I see are people like your parents, but they have four or five big houses and they have no loans they have no well, my more. father was always flashing money around but he did not share that with his family and i have had another sibling come forward to say that and he lived just around the corner from us and and we have photographic evidence that my father was involved with his mother to prove that my father had another family and possibly more families as well so i think he was sharing his money between a number of households. Mm -hmm. It is very strange because often the children are uh, dressed very expensively and uh, in school normally they, they must see this, they must say how is this possible? The mother is home and the father is the postman. How is it possible? They are dressed with very expensive and, and um, fancy uh, shoes and clothes but everybody is keeping silent. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that comes back again. Then I was uh, wondering if there has been in, uh, DNA investigations on the crime scenes and searches. Uh, you say that you know where some bodies are from ch mm -hmm. children, but they, they refuse also to yes. investigate. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on right. two, three cases like this in Europe too. So it's, yes. it's not a surprise to me. Um, the, the thing they do is, 
making you as a victim complicit to so you would shut up yeah basically yes what statement would you give to all these victim com compliers now there are uncountable people like you but they dare not speak out because they they were forced in, in complicity to commit crimes themselves yes what, what would you tell them the only way to have a completely clear conscience is for them to come forward follow the lead of others like myself who are speaking up regardless of the dangers mm -hmm. just do it because it's worth it it's worth it on a soul level I can't say that I sleep well at night still. I still have nightmares. But I know that in my heart, I've tried my best. More than your best. Don't you think, and that's maybe more a question for Chris Cleverly, that we should uh, force to change the laws uh, concerning victims that were forced to yes. commit crimes so that they have the opportunity to come forward and help investigations uh, to a to, 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 um, solution. Yes, I mean, yes. there are those, of course, almost all those criminals have been in their childhood victims. And somehow we have to cut these circles, these, these vicious circles, because otherwise it will never stop. But somehow maybe I have to discuss this with, uh, with Chris later. We have to find a way um, for these victims that became criminals and that speak out like you do to have other laws. Yes. Because some of them were victims, uh, were compliant to crimes, victims and, cri and criminals at the same time, but choose to, com to, to become criminal. But yes. those like you do, you, you, you preserved your soul and your consciousness, uh, you speak out. I think this is another matter. We should have laws to encourage people like you yes. to be safe and to come forward to testify. Yes, I agree, Corinne. Something has to be done to change the Absolutely. culture of fear and silence. Yes, but also I think for people involved, in the police, in the justice departments, they see, they know that things are wrong, but they are too afraid for their jobs. Well, yes. I'm sorry, what does your job mean against the death or the disappearance of a child? Mm -hmm. Oh God, I so much hope hell exists. Really, I really do hope. Um, did you talk to the parents of the missing children about what you know about them? No, I did not. Uh, I didn't want to add any more salt to their wounds, basically. Um, as far as they would know, nothing about me. Um, I, I thought that would be cruel. So, no, I have not done that. No, but me, it is important for these parents to know where their children are, even after 30, 40 years. Is there a way, or do you know some moderator who can be a kind of an in-between you and these parents? I so have you been can put more vocal. pressure. Via the parents, you can put more pressure to force the police to do their jobs. Yeah. Well, I was rather okay. hoping that that would occur. I did go forward. I've, I've been very public mm -hmm. on Facebook and other, in other media areas. About yeah, I, mean, my allegations. I think you've probably done as much as you probably can as an individual going yeah. through the experience that you're going through at the moment. But certainly with support from people like ourselves and uh, with Commissioner Corrine, um, certainly we can start to put the network together of those people yeah. who have been victimised into which create a structure um, which will give you the support and those who have also are the parents of victims the support, the unknowing parents of victims, the support that's necessary to do this. Um, I'm particularly uh, aware of the repetition of the Edwardstown tunnels as a feature throughout this and your continuing fear in relation to the continuance of perpetration of these crimes in that area. Um, I'm very mindful of that. 
Um, and it's certainly something that uh, we will discuss offline with our team here. Um, and I'm very grateful for you to putting that forward. I think that any other supporting evidence that you can get in relation to live testimony, um, in relation to that, um, let's start to bring those people together. Let's start to voice those concerns. Um, one voice can only speak so loudly. Yeah. Many voices can speak so much louder. Mm -hmm. and so from us here, um, we, we, we very clearly wish to support you on this. I, I've been very uh, moved by the testimony, as I'm sure the other commissioners have been. And we mm -hmm. wish to support you further. Um, I, I, I return back to Commissioner Karine uh, Hotspot uh, to, to close off for us. Karine? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yes. I'm going to close off, but um, to those watching your statement, what do you want to say, Rachel? Ask yourselves why a person who has never been before the media before, uh, apart from a very short interview way back in 2007, why would I keep fighting for this over the last 12 years for no financial gain and for no other reason, certainly not wanting fame, I'm a normal person, I just, I want to fade into the background, but I'm not in a position where I'm allowed to do so. Why would I be doing this if it was not true? Absolutely. Why would I put myself in this danger? Yeah. You have nothing but trouble. But you're brave enough to do it. And it's thanks to people like you uh, who are brave enough. And I hope a lot of people who see your testimony and the testimonies of the other brave women and men uh, come forward uh, as witnesses, as victims, but also from within the system. We need to change it. We need to have justice done for all these children being abused at this very moment, being tortured and killed at this very moment, but also for those who have been through this like you and who did not survive this. For all these human beings, we need justice. That's why it's the International Tribunal for Natural Justice. I am very grateful for your support testimony and I hope I can get your email and we'll stay in contact and we'll do Absolutely. what we have to do. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel.